So after Jesus ascended into heaven and the early church had the Feast of Pentecost, there arose a question, and it is a question that has echoed down to the centuries and should be echoing in each of our lives every single day as well. And the question is, what is the impact of the Incarnation on the world? What is the impact of the Incarnation on the world? My life. This is the central question that differentiates the life of a Christian from everybody else. And from this question, there arises a lot of theological questions. And so St. Paul's letters in the New Testament, it's basically entirely a reflection of the impact of the Incarnation. What does that mean? In the early church, we know from the first ecumenical council, there was a question, okay, what does the incarnation mean about the Old Testament laws? Do we still need to be circumcised? This is one of the questions that arose. What is the impact of the incarnation? There was a heresy in the early church called Gnosticism. Gnosticism denied that Jesus was truly human. They said that he was merely God under the appearance of human form. Then there was the heresy of Arianism, from which we had the Council of Nicaea, from which we get the Nicene Creed. The Arian heresy said that Jesus was fully human, but he was not fully God. Because Arius couldn't comprehend how God could be in two places at once. How can God the Father be in heaven, and yet God the Son on earth? It's the Arian heresy. The next major heresy that arose in the church was the Nestorian heresy. Heresy, Nestorian heresy. And it is the Nestorian heresy from which we get our saint today. Saint Cyril of Alexandria was the great champion against the Nestorian heresy. The Nestorian heresy was in many ways a prefigurement of a dominant heresy we see today among Protestant Christians. Nestorius was a priest, and I believe he was a bishop as well. But he got uncomfortable when people started saying that Mary was the mother of God, that she was the Theotokos, which means the God-bearer. She was the mother of God, and he was very uncomfortable with this. He thought it was exalting Mary's dignity too much. That's why I say it's a prefigurement of many Protestant Christians today. They're very uncomfortable with how we talk about Mary. St. Cyril, famously argued against Nestorius. Nestorius was saying that we can't say that Mary is the mother of God. We have to say that Mary is just the mother of the human nature of Jesus, but not the mother of the second person, the Holy Trinity. And so there was a great argument that arose, and at the Council of Ephesus, this was resolved. The church came up with something called the communication of idioms, right? This was even greater clarified at the Council of Chalcedon shortly thereafter. That basically whatever you say of the human nature of Jesus, you can also say about his divine nature. Right? Because Jesus in one person has both natures. 
He's not partly human and partly God. He is fully human and fully God. And it's united in one person. This is called the hypostatic union. Hypostasis in Greek means person. And so in one person, the fullness of the divine nature and the fullness of the human nature combine into one person. Therefore, you can't just say that Mary is the mother of the human nature of Jesus. You have to say she is the mother of the God-man. She is truly the mother of God. As Catholics, we, we pay so much honor to Mary, and it's not just because we have a strange obsession with Mary. It's because we truly understand what it means that she gave birth to the man who was God incarnate. And from that, so many of the doctrines that we believe about her come to fruition. It's not us inventing things. It's us fully reflecting on her dignity as the mother of Jesus and therefore the mother of God. This is one of the reasons, we talk about this question of the Incarnation, this is one of the reasons why we do need an infallible church. So many Christians think that if we could all just read the Bible, we could all agree on it. But even in the earliest days of the church, even the apostles themselves were divided about the question of circumcision. In the fourth century, the majority of the bishops were confused about whether or not Jesus was fully God or not. All throughout church history, there are debates and confusions that arise. And there is a need for an infallible authority to decide those disputes for us, that we can be sure that our doctrine is correct and we are truly united.